in the rise of my little pony fandom. Um, I'm gonna assume most people here are bronies. Are there any non-bronies here? One, two, three. Okay, I'm talking directly to you people for most of this. The rest of you use this information to help convince your friends to watch the Grinch. <laughs> um, it's a great time to be a brony. I mean, this is really the height of the fandom. It's probably going to go downhill from here, unfortunately. And uh, Lauren Krauss has actually left the show. But um, the Huffington Post has mentioned po uh, ponies. The Wired magazine mentioned ponies. Ponies has, has been a topic on White Wait, Don't Tell Me, where they actually interviewed President Clinton and asked him questions about ponies. Uh, ponies. <laughs> the ponies are everywhere. They're taking over. And they are awesome. Uh, so, you know, those of you who maybe don't know the history of how this fandom started to come about, maybe as fans of the show, it's a weird thing. And as this thing started to come up, people didn't realize if the people uh, involved in this, the fandom were trolls, if they were just messing with people, or if they actually genuinely liked the show. And actually, no one really could believe that, that uh, a show for 12 year old girls could be entertaining. Uh, and why do 20 year old geeks like My Little Pony? Because it's fantastic. It's just a good cartoon show, right? Uh, it, it's not much more difficult than that. I, I don't think there's any deep psychological reason, uh, hypnotism or anything. Uh, most geeks just like good things, be it comic books, anime, uh, cartoons, and My Little Pony is one of those. I am Scott Spaziani. I'm a blogger and podcaster at the Talk Interview. You might have heard me on the Anime News Network podcast or Project Harvey podcast. Uh, I'm an ashamed brony, and no one should be an ashamed brony. Hell yeah, bronies! So what are bronies? We're just simple metal party things, right? None of us are as loving as all of us. Uh, it's like one of the weird things about the My Little Pony community, especially since it rose up in a troll-laden fest like uh, 4chan, is extremely kind, extremely loving. Um, that might be ironic, uh, but you see the memes popping up like, I'm gonna love and tolerate the uh, bleep out of you <laughs> children in the audience. Uh, love and tolerate the shit out of you. And, um, you know, the aspect of My Little Pony that is really weird is it just gets into you. It starts to consume you. And <laughs> people come up to you and they, they ask you, why are you watching a cartoon show? What are you, what are you doing? And I, you know, it's especially the songs. <laughs> so once you start working the songs into your, into your daily routine, you know, getting ready, getting to work, uh, eating lunch, that, that, that one gets, gets, <laughs> <laughs> that one gets some lunch. I find it fitting that around March is really when this thing started to explode and uh, sp uh, spring was coming to an end, or winter was coming to an end, and that's all I could do was just watch winter wrap up all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so this thing part started on uh, uh, 4chan, and um, it's an odd thing to come from 4chan, uh, where uh, <coughs> memes begin in childhood, it's go to die. <laughs> and uh, slowly uh, from the co, it seeped out and started to consume. <laughs> 4chan. Uh, this is the a graph of pony posts per day and pony threads on 4chan. And by March, there was over 6,000 posts per day in pony threads. Uh, this this graph is from the excellent Equestria Daily. Um, it got so bad that they had 4chan started to have to make rules to restrict pony posts. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and um, it's it, you know the, the really key about this is, is they're reaching an unintended demographic uh, that shouldn't really like. It's like my favorite thing in the world is going up to you know going onto YouTube and looking at pony pony uh, videos and seeing the comments and having people say stuff like uh, I'm, I'm a 20 year old man and I love this show. Um, I wish my sister would leave the room so I can continue watching ponies. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there was one great one where uh, the kid's mom came into the room. He closed the browser really quickly. She asked, are you watching pornography? And he sheepishly just admitted to watching pornography. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Uh, so what I'm going to talk to uh, talk about today, I'm going to talk about the uh, uh, let's just say origin. I'm going to talk about the origin of my little pony, uh, where it came from, how this thing actually started, and how the four chambers got word of it. Uh, because most, you know, most American shows uh, that are aimed at uh, you know, 12-year-old girls go unnoticed by the four chamber community. Uh, I'm going to try to go over why we love ponies if we have time, and then we will, and then you can kick us out soon. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm going to. Oh no, I'm not going to. I'm not say you. Okay. No, Rim will stop by. And um, I'm going to go into the community. What uh, what really makes this show addicting is the community and uh, how the community is <coughs> affecting the show as it goes forward is, is one probably the most interesting aspect of one of the problems. So how did the show for little girls become popular among 20 year old geeks? This is the question. Uh, so in I think 2000, late 2000 or early 2010, I don't know if that's exactly yeah, the timetable. Uh, uh, Discovery Kids was partially purchased by Hasbro and they formed The Hub. And The Hub was Hasbro's attempt to make toy commercials, just 24 hours a day. It worked. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously. And um, the Cartoon Brew, which is a very popular cartoon blog, picked up this story and started to run with it. They, uh, one of their, um, Editors uh, Amid Amedi, which I'm going to mispronounce every time I say it from now on, uh, wrote an article called The End of Creator Driven Era in TV Animation. Uh, this age uh, postulated that in the 1990s and 2000s there was a uh, uh, there was a golden age compared to the toy driven animation in the 1980s. Um, Hasbro's Hub returns to the 1980 toy driven uh, model, and this in turn would uh, destroy. Uh, any creativity and animation going forward. Yeah, this guy's come forward. <laughs> it's also the, re the re emergence of Margaret Loesch. I'm sorry, I hate to interrupt, but um, did you say you had to move out of here at some point? Uh, they, told, uh, they told me uh, that they were going to be filming at 1045. Okay, I have just repaired the TV in that room, yeah. so you guys are all set to go back in there if you need to. And if you see me floating around, if you have any other problems, just flag me down. I'll, 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 I'll straighten them out. There's going to be a little bit of they said that yesterday. So in that no, here. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I don't know. I don't know the schedule. Okay. But if they if they do kick you out of here, you can go right back. Okay. Because it should be straight. If it's not, get me. I'll fix it. All right. It's up to you guys. If you want to move right back, right, right, right now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll stay here. Okay. Yes. Thank you for fixing it. Thank you. So Margaret Loesch, uh, she was uh, CEO of Marvel Animation Studios in the 1980s, and she took over Fox uh, in early in the 90s, and her MO is, let's make cartoons that sell toys. And she takes over the hub, and Amin Amedi uh, believes she's the devil, because her emergence is the end of the world. <laughs> So as 4chan does, they picked this up and they started to rip it apart. Uh, on Co, the, the, the criticism came up. One of them, the most, but the biggest one is that it's alarmist. Uh, obviously, just because one channel emerges, that doesn't mean that creator-driven animation is going to disappear. Um, he writes off the skilled animators working on hub uh, programming as admission of defeat. Uh, actually, insults him. I have that. Um, it's, it's, uh, it curdles the blood. Uh, he also talks a lot about internet animation, as if he's running this in 2002. Uh, it sounds like he's never heard of Newgrounds. <laughs> uh, some quotes. This is the only academic part. Uh, you, you, know, you can fall asleep, probably. Uh, watching names like Rob Rosini and Lauren Faust pop up in the credits of a toy-based anime series like My Little Pony is an admission of defeat for the entire movement, a white flag-waving moment for the TV animation industry. No, it's not. Those are talented animators, and maybe they joined the show because they might have some control and could do some good. What, what do you think of you? You're just kind of flaming you now, Mr. Cartoon Blogger. As more artists choose animation, and as a creator, will find themselves unattached to specific distribution formats as in the past. That's right, because Disney, Disney started drawing cartoons to make movies. He didn't draw cartoons just because he liked drawing cartoons. Uh, fewer artists in the future will say, I want to work in TV animation, or my goal is features. Have, have, anyone, have, have you heard anyone say that? Yeah. <laughs> oh, come on. Who cares? You're making cartoons. You're making cartoons. 
These mindsets belong to a bygone time where television and theaters held a disproportionate sway over other mo mo modes of content distribution. Again, this was news in 2002. <laughs> Everybody creates equally today. For something to not to be creator-driven is the anomaly. Wait a minute. What did he just say? Something not to be creator-driven is an anomaly. He wrote this in an essay called The End of Creator-Driven Era in TV Animation. <laughs> uh, people make entire web-based series from the comfort of their bedroom and become famous for it. Uh, well, you know, most people who really become famous on the internet for making animation or films get absorbed into the mainstream and then start making animation and films for money because no one makes money on the internet. I'm on the internet, I don't make any money. Uh, at the end of the day, TV animation isn't going anywhere, and future Margaret Moshes will still find plenty of willing peons to fulfill their orders for extended toy commercials. Just call Hard Fast a peon. <laughs> what, 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 what? Why would you do that? Uh, and other I mean, these are people who are you know, working for a paycheck and trying to get by, and you're calling them peons of corporate America? Go, go back to the 60s. Uh, so Co, you know, Co took this, took this article, ripped it apart, made fun of this guy because he, he's just either flaming or doesn't know what he's talking about, or lives a, you know, in some kind of uh, time trapped really era. Is he really old? Maybe he's really old. Uh, he doesn't look old. I've seen pictures. Uh, but the main thing that Co got from this when they started ripping it apart is, Lord Frost has a new TV show. <laughs> <laughs> Who is Lauren Faust? Uh, let's just see. You might recognize some of these titles. Powerpuff Girls. Yeah! Yeah! She was a storyboard artist, a writer, director, supervising director for the Powerpuff Girls. Uh, she also did Foster's Home for Imagine. Yeah! Uh, developer, developer, supervising producer, etc. She made the whole show. Let's just stop. <laughs> Why you guys name she missing a slide. <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, she influenced animation worldwide. I mean, so you have this blogger insulting someone, <coughs> calling someone a peon who is one of the most influential animators in the, the 2000s. Uh, some proof. Japan took Powerpuff Girls and made their own anime out of it. Uh, no, it's the other way around. It was awful. Hey, it doesn't matter. <laughs> It's still, Lauren Faust probably still got a paycheck from it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in the, the Gynax's recent anime painting and cycle, Garnabelt stole, steals heavily from steel. Also married to Craig McCracken, creator of Powerpuff Girls and Foster's Home for Imagine <laughs> Friends, as well as a director and writer on Dexter's Laboratory. <laughs> so, you know, imagine being someone in, you know, Time travel back to October of 2010. You're, you know, you're, uh, you spend 90% of your time on Co. You learn that these talented people are involved in your cartoon show. You're gonna start watching it. You're gonna start posting about it. You're gonna start spreading it. And that's how My Little Pony became what it is today. A huge, man, huge, relatively large fandom. Uh, and the uh, geeks everywhere start to be consumed by it. Why do we love ponies? Uh, the character. Uh, let's talk about the characters. All of them, unlike any other incarnation of My Little Pony in most American cartoons, they have a strong sense of indi individual character with distinct personalities. Uh, that's why the ensemble cast exists, so you can have a, a group of characters that play off each other and, and, uh, and create a well-rounded show. Uh, they're introduced with solid characteristics. From the bat, they, you know, in a uh, small snip snippet of animation, you know these characters, and you, you know what, the, the, what uh, their personalities are, you know what the characteristics are. You get an idea of what you're going to expect from them going forward. Characters get their own arcs throughout the series to, to, uh, uh, to develop as they go on. Uh, very much like in, in a classic, any classic anime, as the series goes on, you have episodes which deal with a couple of characters, you have episodes to deal with the entire cast, but you also have those couple episodes that focus on a single character where you can really dive down deep and, uh, and, and get and get a real uh, exp exploration of what that character is, what he's thinking, what he's all about. And uh, this is how they introduced Rainbow Dash. And from this, you get to know a lot about Rainbow Dash. Oh, look how fun this is. 
This small clip is really going to define who Rainbow Dash is and what to expect from her going forward. Hmm. There's supposed to be a Pegasus pony named Rainbow Dash clear in the clouds. Well, she's not doing a very good job, is she? <laughs> So going forward, I mean, we can clearly see what character arcs are going to develop around, around Rainbow Dash. And she, she improves her skills and uh, plays practical jokes and other things. So let's talk about world building. Uh, it's unlike most My Little Ponies and other cartoons, uh, cartoons for little girls. This has a persistent world, and the world is slowly revealed as the show goes on, just like in any in any good piece of uh, fantasy fiction. Each new kind of story arc gives you more information about the world. And the, as the further you watch the show, the more the more you know about the world and vice versa. No, that's not right. Vice versa. That's not right. Um, the specific rules of the world are explained through the plot, so you never you never get expository dialogue. You never get any info dumps. It's it's all you know. Just by watching it and enjoying the show, you're actually absorbing a huge amount of information about the world already has been developed. Yeah, no, so there's almost no expository dialogue. Uh, in this scene, we get uh, information about a tournament being held that Rainbow Dash is going to be involved in. Thank you so much for helping me clean up all these books, guys. It was a crazy weekend of study. <laughs> <laughs>
strut your stuff in that competition? Yeah, I wish you guys could be there. Butterfly is a great support, but her cheering isn't exactly inspirational. So, if we get information about this. That's a great way to stop it. It's been perfect. We get a lot of information about the, the tournament, and there's a question in the vote here. Why can't the other ponies go to see Rainbow Dash fly? And, well, they're just jerks? Maybe they have some kind of doctor's appointment? What's going on? And at this point, it's never explained. But shortly afterwards, we get more information. Minutes, I'll explain it for you. We're going to taste an apple. Well, guess we better get this cleaned up. Again. Go on, go on. Go on what? Find a spell that will get us Rima's ponies into Cloudsdale. Can you see how nervous she was? I love nervous? This joke. Have you spit your bit or something? She was tooting her own horn ladders in the breast section of a marching band. Oh, please. I've done enough fashion shows to recognize stage fright when I see it. We've got to find a way to be there for her. Now go all out. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, Pinkie Pie. How'd you do that? <laughs> you landed on my feet when Rainbow Dash knocked me into the cookie. <laughs> 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 I used to fly for three days. Oh, it looks really difficult. I'm not sure I can do it. You've got to try. <laughs> but who's going to volunteer to be the test subject? <laughs> Quickly afterwards, and very naturally, we learn why the other ponies can't go watch Rainbow Dash fly. Only ponies who can fly can actually go into clouds there because it's the home of the Pegasus ponies and it's in the clouds. And if you don't have wings, I, would, I don't suggest walking on clouds. <laughs> but they, you know, there's a bunch of ways they could have done with this, done this, and you know, to, to save time. And it's something that anime does often to save time and to be lazy. Is when Rainbow Dash first walked in, she just goes, "Oh, I wish you guys uh, were Pegasus ponies and could walk on clouds and could come see me fly." But that's not what they did. They decided to make the battle very natural and actually write the show. Uh, of course, we have lots of fantasy creatures. Uh, this is a cockatrice. That was close. Um, we have manticores, we have sea serpents, we have whatever that is, or some minor. We have dragons, we have phoenix, phoenix, phoenixes. Uh, we have Hydra, and we have the Dark Lord herself. <laughs> what fantasy story is complete without a dark lord? Uh, so nerds, ner you know, these are all things pulled basically from the Dungeons and Dragons monster manual. Uh, of course, that online there's all the conspiracy theories going around. You, you know, uh, Hasbro owns Wizard of the Coast, who owns the license to Dungeons and Dragons, uh, so they just have access to every single uh, D and D creature available. And hopefully one day they're going to create a tie-in campaign that brings the ponies yes. and gives them a <laughs> uh, Let's talk about the humor of the show. Fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this guy's going to hurt me. A lot of the humor, because this is a show aimed at little girls, uh, is, is eye rolling. And it's, uh, Get the fuck out of here. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't. We are talking about a 12 year old girl show. Uh, DJ Poe 3. You know, you're good with this. I roll like it. Come on. All right. The, the, the humor that is very good uh, is the character humor. Because, and it's because the characters are extremely well written. Uh, obviously, anytime you get good characters into a room and allow them to interact, there's going to be some fantastic jokes because they have chemistry. When you have chemistry, you have natural humor. Um, in, this, in this scene, uh, which is, cracks me up like a child every time I see it. it uh, they're going to um, drop off a tree, which Applejack, <laughs> which Applejack is named Bloomberg, uh, to the frontier town, uh, I guess, which is still within this fantasy world. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna drop it there. <laughs> Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe it's time we 
all got a little shut eye. We've got a big day ahead of us tomorrow. <laughs> Aww. these two, it's music and hidden themes. Um, the music in My Little Pony is very good. What's your wrap up, please? What's your wrap up is my favorite. That's not a music video. Evil That's not a music video according to this. Uh, or Good Cupcake song. Five um, The music is very good. Uh, it's all original music for the show. It's, uh, most of it is done in the musical style. Hold on. Wait, don't get ahead. Um, and the, all the musical numbers uh, help the characters in the world develop. Uh, again, you know, they're not, they don't waste any time in My Little Pony. They're not just putting little cute character songs in there to sell albums. The, ca the songs themselves serve a purpose in the narrative. Evil Enchantress. <laughs> Does that really help the plot? Evil, Evil Enchantress is an interesting example because Evil Enchantress gave you a quick way to, to show what the average Ponyville citizen thought of this weird figure who lives in the woods. A, you know, in that cute little song, which is catchy, you see, okay, so they're being kind of racist and they're trying to conclusions here. <laughs> so yes, it did serve a very important point, uh, plot point in that episode. Uh, but also, the show is filled with hidden themes that uh, the 12-year-old girls aren't going to get. Uh, one of them is the Sabenheim uh, connection that Bertrand mentions. Uh, so this is the first part of Art of the Duress, uh, which is Rarity's character, so I'm in Rarity's character episode, and uh, it's very enjoyable. And uh, I, I, love, I love the beginning here. It shows how cocky Rarity is, uh, and, but at the same time, she's helping her friends, and Rarity kind of balances that dynamic during the entire series. So, all you have to do is make a different, stunning, original, amazing outfit for one, two, three, four, five, plus yourself six ponies, and lickety split. Oh, I will die. Fucking do. You think it's done to be funny? We're going to trust making. Don't, don't worry, don't worry, guys. I got this. Oh my god. 
So, so boiled down, uh, The Art of the Dress really is a, a song about a creator who loves to create and who thinks creating is fascinating, it's wonderful, sure, okay? That quality music in one episode, that was pretty good. <laughs> yes, it is. I mean, the, the reason is it's a homage to Stephen Sondheim's song putting it together. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, no, no, we're gonna have to do it. Twenty percent cooler, motherfuckers. Yeah. Oh no, it's it's uh, again, you know, these songs are character songs, and they're helping develop the character, and it, of course they're gonna reflect her current state of mind. Um, so it's not much to Stephen Sondheim's song putting them together, and uh, I think every other kind of panel should have some uh, many to take in, so I'm gonna toss them in. Woo! Fighting, putting it together. Family, totally. Fighting, only way to make the work of art. Every moment makes a contribution, and every little detail plays a part. No installation's no solution, everything depends on exception, putting it together. That's right, that's a, you get a point. No one's actually listened to it. Yes, it is. Um, so, at the core, Art of the Dress is a commentary uh, of artists working for not artists. The first part is an artist just wallowing in, in loving to create, and having the most wonderful time, and it's so easy, and I love every second of it. The second part changes all that because she's actually working for someone now. She's not working for herself, and she has to uh, to, to create for her masters. Uh, so it's a commentary artist working for non-artists, and of course this is a cartoon show. So these are all animators, these are all talented artists who are doing this, and they probably have all experiences like this, uh, probably with the people who are hiring them to make the show as well. Uh, non-artists think they know aesthetic design. Uh, most don't. Uh, you don't hire someone to design a plane uh, and then uh, tell them how the plane is designed. However, you do design someone, uh, hire someone to design a website and then tell them how the website should look. Uh, and the most interesting part of uh, the second half of our address is the ponies actually break character. It, it's it's fascinating. It's in the final bridge, and then they break character, uh, and, and they, you know it's it's the, like the weirdest thing once you you slow down and you realize what's happening because it's the artist voices bleeding through and just talking directly to the audience and saying how much children how much bull they have to go through <laughs> in order to actually get uh, get work done as an artist. Um, one one example I love. Uh, any oatmeal fans out there? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the oatmeal did this wonderful comic called. Um, how a web design, uh, how a web design goes to hell. Um, so this is how the comic starts. He's hired to design a wonderful website. It looks gorgeous. Uh, the boss seems to be happy with it, and he's not. And then he starts redesigning. He starts bringing his uh, family in, and the secretary, and everyone gets a say. And in the end, it looks like this. Uh, so that's the spirit of the second half of the year of the dress. Uh, and I, 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 will, I want you all to list, pay f close attention to that bridge. Uh, and just see where the characters break. Because, I mean, e even something, remember, they're not paying Rarity. Rarity is doing them a favor, and that's, that's like a huge part of it. But that, that bridge is, is, is so brilliant, and it just snuck in there. Now, the stars on my belt need to be technically accurate. Orion has three stars on his belt, not oh. four. Stitch by stitch, stitching it together. Do you not like the color? The color's fine, just make it look cooler. Do you not like the 
So you have the, sh the creators are putting out this show, which is causing a massive re uh, response in the community, and the community is doing things that are, are being noticed by the show's creators. They're, they're incorporating things into the narrative. Derpy. Uh, I love that. demotivational posters. This is my favorite one because it's so true. I, I really, I really would like to thank the Lauren House put that foreshadowing in. I doubt, I doubt she did, but uh, I'm just going to believe that from now on. Um, uh, there's been a ton of cartoon mashups with ponies, classic cartoons, cartoon people, and the series alone. This is my favorite. Her eyes looked cross-eyed, and 
the community, unfortunately, saw it and you know, cross uh, you know, she has derpy eyes. There's no getting around that. So of course she's derpy hooves, and she has bubbles on her flank, and no one knows why. What talent that uh, suggests? No, no, no. Like, oh, was it explained? Yeah, um, it was because apparently she had a bubbly personality. Oh, fair enough. That makes her more derpy. That's amazing. <laughs> Uh, the community created a backstory for her uh, and made her the, the male pony of Ponyville. Uh, in episode 15 of the show, uh, Derby becomes a cannon. Oh, take this down. Twitchy tail. Twitchy tail? Twitchy tail! We can't let them over here, remember? Something's gonna fall! my favorite one, and it's not used as widely as it should be, but it's the one I, I kept seeing uh, when I first started getting into the show, and it, it so matches the way the ponies just kind of sneak their way into your subconscious and take over your mind. Um, these are the two most popular ones, confound these ponies that drive me to drink, I can't, can't stop thinking about them, um, confound these ponies that drive me to a song uh, the first the first day I started watching ponies, I was up till 2.30 in the morning, work day, uh, watching cartoon horses. Me too. Um, I'm the you explain that one to your father. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, this actually has, as I didn't realize, it, but this does have a link to something else that was going on for at the time that the show came out. Um, it's pretty great. The Dover boys trapped them. She gives herself, she gives herself one second. Um, someone in the, in the room is actually going to really enjoy this next one. Several 
different characters, the same color with that beauty mark. That's right. One of them has David Tennant's hair, one of them has Fit Dr. Kim. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. One's also a Pegasus. A Pegasus, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Um, so yes, we they are Time Lord ponies. Um, <laughs> and that's something that the animators publicly did purposely do. It is like I hope I hope they did. I mean, what else could a a, a hourglass on the flank mean? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the pony even looks like it. No, we just need to see. Randomly screen go. It's 10:51 a.m. So they should. They definitely should. It's a spin-off show. Season two. Um, so the you know these memes are going around. The community is doing what the community does and just creating and creating and creating. And eventually, the show's creators just start to pick up on. Love it, of course, because people are loving what they created and remixing it, and they're artists, and they, they understand this. Um, and after the end of the My Little Pony series, um, this ad came out for the first rerun. Yeah. Yeah. Finally, it legitimizes the male audience and the older audience, I guess, ultimately. Um, it canonizes DJ Pony as, as, a, as his official name. Uh, it's also a really good parody of Black Pony Girls. <laughs> Whoa, this is my team!
any non-bronies who are still here, uh, and anyone here who wishes to convert to non-bronies, uh, enough any ammunition in this panel to convince anyone that my little Tommy uh, is at least the greatest show of America. <laughs> at the very least. And frankly, if, if you give them all this information and they still kind of shut you and, and turn you down and won't uh, embrace the ponies, there's only one credible answer to that. <laughs> This one is my favorite.